Hello everyone, my name is Rachel and welcome back to my channel. So the case that I have for you guys today is one that went unsolved for 10 years until literally last month when new information came out that finally solved this cold case. This is definitely a frustrating case to listen to because it could have been solved long before it was, but I'm glad that we finally have some sort of closure and the family has the answers that they've been looking for for so long. But before we get into today's video, I wanted to go ahead and say a huge thank you to today's sponsor, Ritual. Ritual has recently released their essential daily protein shakes to help with the maintenance of lean muscle mass and promote healthy, active aging for everybody, not just athletes. Working in the healthcare field, I know just how important protein is to your diet, whether you consider yourself a high-level athlete or if you just want to maintain a healthy lifestyle. Ritual's Essential Protein 18 Plus has 20 grams of vegan pea protein containing all nine essential amino acids, providing a complete amino acid profile to help you build lean muscle mass, keep you fuller longer, and support bone health. And you can feel good about what you're putting into your body because with Ritual, just like all of their other products, their essential protein is soy-free, gluten-free, vegan-friendly, and it's formulated with non-GMO ingredients with no sugar added or sugar alcohol. Alcohols. I happen to be a vegetarian who is also a bit of a picky eater, so I often lack protein in my diet if I'm not very intentional about adding it to my daily routine. I love adding some of Ritual's vanilla protein into my daily protein shake. Another great thing is that their supply chain for essential protein is fully traceable. Their amazing vanilla flavor is handcrafted using direct from the farmer vanilla bean extract sustainably harvested in Madagascar, while their pea protein is derived from peas grown in the USA using regenerative farming practices. Essential protein is also available in daily formulas to use for 18 plus, 50 plus for pregnancy and postpartum. The exciting news is that my subscribers can get a massive 20% off of your first month by going to Ritual dot com slash Rachel 20 and using code Rachel 20 at checkout. That's ritual.com slash Rachel 20 for 20% off of your first month of ritual. Thank you again so much to Ritual for sponsoring today's video. Okay, so with all of that being said, let's get into today's case. Today, we are going to be discussing the solved case of Kara Nichols. Kara Nichols was born on May 20th, 1993 to her parents, Paul and Julia Nichols in Colorado Springs, Colorado. She grew up in Colorado Springs with her older brother named Terrence and a younger sister. Kara was described as being very social, having a lot of friends, and was very close with her family. She was known to love art and took private lessons in school to improve her drawing skills. She was so very talented, winning several awards in different community and school art competitions. She loved drawing sketches of models in beautiful gowns and dresses. However, once Kara hit her teen years, she started to act out. When she was 13 years old, she was arrested for shoplifting and was sentenced to community service. She went on to attend Rampart High School initially, but she was not handling school well. When she was around 16 years old during her sophomore year of high school, her dog actually passed away, which had a really big effect on her mental health. She went into a very deep depression and started going to counseling. She was prescribed medication for her mental health struggles, but she did not like taking them because they had some pretty severe side effects. It was also thought that she could have been suffering from bipolar and possibly a borderline personality disorder. Around the same time, unfortunately, Kara started experimenting with different drugs. Again, it seemed to be one of those situations where she was just in so much emotional turmoil that she felt that using drugs was the only way to numb the pain, Kara actually ended up using heroin at this time. So Kara's parents ended up enrolling her in different alternative schools for the remainder of her high school career. She ended up really liking the school called Life Skills of Colorado Springs because the program was set up in a way that allowed her to work at her own pace. She ended up graduating from this school before getting a job as a waitress for the time being. But her real dream was to become a model. She was beautiful and outgoing, and this seemed to be a career that could really suit her. By the summer of 2012, Kara's parents ended up moving to Chicago, Illinois. Kara moved with them initially, but during this time, she did continue using drugs. So her parents enrolled her in a drug treatment program in Chicago, 
but this unfortunately didn't last very long because she had been kicked out after refusing to follow the rules. She did go back home to live with her parents in Chicago, but ultimately made the decision to move back to Colorado Springs. This definitely was not something that her parents wanted or were really okay with. They were actually very against this but she legally was an adult at this point, so there really was nothing that they could do to prevent her from moving back, so she did ultimately move back to Colorado Springs. Plus, her brother Terrence was still living in Colorado Springs, so she would still be close to him, so she still would have family in the area. The two were very close. They were in contact with each other pretty much every single day, so Kara's parents knew that she probably still would be safe out in Colorado Springs because she did have her brother. After moving back to Colorado Springs, Kara ended up moving into a house with three other men. Of course, at first, this definitely seemed like something she should not be doing. Her mother was initially very against this as well, but I guess sort of after getting to know these men better, Julia's concerns were put to rest and she wasn't too worried about her being roommates with these men anymore. She thought that these men seemed nice and they seemed completely harmless. And before anybody wants to make snap decisions or be judgmental, I've actually had four male roommates in my life. I've had a time where it was me and two male roommates, all men who I was not dating. And they were all amazing different guys who I definitely would be roommates with again, who I'm very close friends with. So it's not always a bad idea to have male roommates, especially if they're great guys who you know. So again, I'm just bringing this up so people don't go straight to that and say, well, this is something that definitely she should not have done because who are we to say? While living back in Colorado Springs, Kara seemed to be doing it pretty well for herself. She was trying to get back to her old waitressing job and was starting to build her modeling portfolio and was starting to look more into different modeling jobs. She started uploading headshots into the Modeling Mayhem website to hopefully get into contact with someone who could get her into some more modeling work. This website is basically built so that you can upload your pictures and then get into contact with different photographers and other professional staff to help jumpstart your modeling career. But while doing all of this, Kara did fall into some pretty severe financial issues and started to rely on her roommates and started borrowing food from them. So on October 9th, 2012, Kara told one of her roommates that she had landed a modeling gig in Denver. Now, Kara did not have her driver's license, so she had to rely on others to drive her around and take her where she needed to be. So that night, she told her roommate that a friend was actually gonna pick her up and drive her to this modeling gig. So she left and a few minutes later, the roommate looked outside and saw a dark colored sedan driving away from their house. The roommate of course assumed that this was the friend who was coming to pick up Kara for her modeling gig. That same night at around 11.45 PM, Kara got into contact with her brother Terrence to let him know about her modeling gig in Denver. But after this, she didn't get back into contact with him the rest of the night. Then, by the time October 10th came around, Terrence assumed that he would have heard back from Kara about how things went with this modeling gig and, you know, just to hear about her night, but she did not get back into contact with him. So, later that day on October 10th, he tried calling his sister, but his calls were just going straight to voicemail. That obviously means that she either turned off her phone or her phone had died. This was very odd to him because like I said, the two were in contact with each other pretty much every single day. So then by October 11th, when Terrence still had not heard from Kara, he grew more and more concerned, so he decided to pay her roommates a visit. When he got there, Kara's roommates told him that they had not seen Kara since the night of October 9th, the same night of this modeling gig. They said that she hadn't been home that night and that none of them had seen or heard from her. So Terrence went in her room to look around and he immediately noticed Kara's cell phone charger, her laptop, her professional makeup case, her purse, her ID, and $300 worth of cash were all still in her bedroom. This absolutely sent Terrence into a panic because he knew that she would not have left these items behind if she were planning on being gone for more than a day. Plus, he noticed that she had not been active at all on any of her social medias since the last time that he had contacted her, and this was very out of character for her. So Terrence went ahead and got into contact with the El Paso Sheriff's Office to report Kara as a missing person. And of course, right away, police responded by saying that Kara is an adult. She's allowed to be missing. 
If she wanted to cut off her family and wanted to stay away for as long as she wanted, she's allowed to do so. But her family knew that this was not Kara. They knew that her not being in contact with anybody and especially her not being active at all on social media meant that she definitely was in some sort of danger. So Julia and Paul flew out to Colorado Springs to start their searches for Kara. When they got to her house, her parents also saw all of the personal belongings that Kara had left behind. Again, they knew that she would not leave these items behind on purpose. So her parents went back to the police to put pressure on them and to get them to take her disappearance more seriously. So after this, police finally opened their investigation. After turning to the public for more information on Kara's disappearance and sort of digging through the internet, police discovered that Kara had actually been online and was advertising escort services for quite some time. When police found this out, the fact that she was doing escort services was the same time that Kara's parents found out as well. Kara's parents had no idea, but she had been doing this for the past two years, so since she was 17 years old, so that she could make money to fund her drug use. They also found out that some of the modeling gigs that she had been involved with were actually covers for her doing escort services. Of course, this was information that the family was unsure of of whether they wanted to release it publicly. They didn't want the public to view her any differently and they didn't want public interest in her case to decline. I actually saw a lot of different websites and articles talk about how, you know, their reservations totally hindered this entire case, slowed any tips that may come in. And I saw one article where the author was basically bashing the parents for not wanting to come out with this information, saying, oh, they think that their daughter's an angel when she's really not and they needed to tell the public about this. But as we see in so many cases, the second that the public finds out that someone may have been a sex worker, suddenly the public doesn't care about them anymore. So I think they're totally justified in their reservations and not really knowing how to process and how to release this information. Plus, knowing how this case went down, I don't think it would have made a difference. So they did ultimately release this information to the public, but just as they feared, public interest in Kara's case quickly declined. News outlets no longer wanted to interview Kara's parents, and the public just didn't seem as interested in helping find her. By November of 2012, police announced that they wanted to speak with two women who were believed to have been last seen with Kara. They were both described as having brown hair, with one of them being seen with her on the day that she disappeared. Police said that these two women are not considered suspects, just persons of interest who they believe have valuable information about Kara's disappearance. One woman was thought to be involved in, you know, this whole world of escorting with Kara, but that information was never released, you know, the connection between these two. But the other woman was thought to be someone that Kara was friends with, so they did end up releasing a photo of this woman. They did this in hopes of getting new tips and leads, and it did work more people started to call in with more information. Police said that they followed up on any lead that they could and any tip that they got, but this didn't really lead them to anything. More tips were called in in the months following, but none of them really panned out. Kara was thought to have been spotted numerous times, one witness saw that she saw her pictures on an escort site based out of Las Vegas, but these pictures didn't end up being her. Another witness called in saying that he saw a man with Kara and the girl appeared to be scared and uncomfortable, but after looking more into this tip, it turned out just to be a man and his girlfriend. So based on all of these tips that were coming in that just weren't really panning out, this case was at a standstill for quite some time. In May, the initial detective on her case, Sheriff Cliff Porter, admitted in a publicly released recording that he didn't spend too much time looking into Kara's case and admitted that he cut corners and ignored clues that could have led them to solving Kara's case. Kara's parents subsequently released a statement saying just how upset this recording made them. They said that they were very upset about how many tips were going unnoticed and uninvestigated. They were very, very upset that the sheriff's office just didn't seem to care about her case whatsoever. So ultimately, a new investigator was assigned to Kara's case 
who was finally able to give this case the momentum that it needed and finally start making connections. So after more digging by February of 2013, police had actually found an ad that Kara had posted on October 29th, 2012 at 7.28 p.m. The ad was titled Sexy New Blonde in Town 21 with a name listed that was not Kara's and include a photo of Kara wearing some lingerie with her phone number listed. So using this, Kara went ahead and looked into Kara's cell phone records to see who she had been in contact with on the night that she disappeared. Police found out that there were a total of eight phone calls placed with one person on October 9th between the hours of 9.58 p.m. and 11.08 p.m. and then her phone was last used at 11.59 p.m. before all activity stopped. But for the time being, again, police did not know who this phone number belonged to. But by Wednesday, May 8th of that same year, the detective that had been assigned to Kara's case received a phone call from a man who said that the phone number who had been in contact with Kara that night belonged to him. This man identified himself as being Joel Hollendorfer, who was 38 years old at the time. He admitted to police that he was seeking escort services on the night of October 9th, 2012, so he responded to Kara's ad. He admitted that the two had spoken and called each other several times that night, but he said that he was looking for an in-call where he would go to the girl's location but the girl that he had been speaking to only did out calls where she comes to his location. So he told police that the two of them did not end up meeting up that night. So then police went ahead and used Kara's cell phone pings to track where she had traveled on the night of October 9th. Because again, we know that she wasn't home all night. We know that a friend or somebody had picked her up that night to go to this modeling gig or as we you know, now no, probably an escort service. Police were actually able to come up with a pretty detailed timeline of where she went on the night that she disappeared. They were able to determine that she had left her home on 6710 Mission Road in Colorado Springs at around 11.16 p.m. She then took Galley Road to Peterson Road and then headed south until she reached Highway 24 and then went eastbound. She then got off Highway 24 and turned northbound onto Mark Schiffel Road then continued north until reaching Woodman Road and then turned westbound. She continued west until reaching Black Forest Road. She took this road north until reaching Volmer Road and then continued on Volmer until turning east onto Burgress Road. Then after driving on Burgress Road for about 60 seconds, her phone stopped pinging. So using all of this information from her cell phone, police were able to determine the location that she had stopped and visited that night. They found out that Joel Hollendorfer actually had 9665 Burgress Road as his parents' address. So again, he clearly lived there and she had literally driven to this area and then her cell phone stopped pinging in this exact area. So using this, police were able to obtain a search warrant to search this property, which was executed on October 15th, 2014. These searches were done by multiple agencies. They used cadaver dogs as well as ground penetrating radar. Joel's mother, Betty, had actually walked the area with the members of the searches and pointed out several locations where horses and other animals had been buried on the property for the past 30 years since they purchased this house in 1985. While police did notice that there were several areas of ground that had been disturbed and dogs did hit on several areas, these sites were not excavated because again, they were thought to just be animal burial sites. Then when searchers didn't find anything on this property, Betty suggested to police that they search a property that Joel had access to, which was across the street located at 11660 Green Acres Lane. Police got into contact with the owners of this property who did give them permission to search. This search warrant was executed on October 22nd. They used four cadaver dogs and put them at the four corners of the 20 acre property and then released them. They saw that all four dogs had traveled to one location, which appeared to be the site of a shallow grave. So of course, course, this site was excavated. When they dug, they saw that there were roots that had been dug up at the site and the hole looked to be just about the size of a human body, but there was no body found in this grave. After these searches, when police went and questioned Joel again, he did say that he had looked Kara up and that he did intend on meeting up with Kara that night and the two had communicated a lot, but 
they didn't end up seeing each other. He even said that at some point that night, they had decided on a separate meeting location at a nearby Waffle House, but they didn't end up meeting here either. He admitted to police that he had used escort services several times and that he was heavily involved in drug use. He said that he was once married, but these issues with drugs, as well as the fact that he was using escort services, had ended the marriage. Police did try to contact his ex-wife, Christina Palmer, for an interview, but they could not reach her for the time being. So after this, there wasn't much more movement in the case, and there were a few different theories going around as to what could have happened to Kara. So the first theory was that she was involved in prostitution and that she was under a pimp, but at some point she decided that she didn't want a pimp anymore and she wanted to go off on her own and not be under a pimp. The thought was that maybe she was trying to separate from this pimp and that he got really angry and killed her because of that. The other thought going along with this was that maybe she owed her pimp money Obviously, we know that she didn't have much money at the time and was eating her roommate's food to survive, so clearly she was not in the best financial situation. So the thought in this theory is that maybe Kara owed her pimp a lot of money that she could not afford to pay back, so he got angry and killed her because of this for revenge or whatever other reasons. The other theory was that maybe she had met up with the wrong person while she was doing these escort services and that she was kidnapped and then put into human trafficking. There was a lot of people who thought that it was very possible that Kara was still alive because there were a lot of public sightings of her, whether it be on different websites or in public places, that that could show that she was still alive but she was being controlled by whoever was trafficking her. These were pretty much the main thoughts of what had happened to Kara for almost a decade. I also will note that at this time, for about 10 years, these cell phone records and this meeting up with Joel and all that had not been released, so people really had no information to go off of. People really just thought that she disappeared and they had no idea that she, you know, had actually met up with this specific person that night. I don't even know if they knew about this ad or released this ad right away. All people really knew was that she was involved in escort services and then she disappeared. It wasn't until almost 10 years later that police would finally be able to get the information that they really needed to finally solve this case and bring justice to Kara and her family. So at this time, police were actually able to locate Joel's ex-wife, Christina, residing in Virginia. The FBI was asked to contact her and assist in conducting an interview with her. By February 1st, 2022, so very recently, FBI Special Agents Brandon Pree and Michael Willis were able to speak with Christina, who finally agreed to give them an interview and give them the information that they had been looking for. In this interview, Christina told the FBI agents that Joel's father had died in November of 2014 and that after he died, Joel had asked Christina to go back out with her and go for a ride with her in his new truck. She agreed and during that ride, Joel told her that he needed to tell her something. She told the FBI that Joel had told her that he had hired an escort and that while they were having sex in his car, he accidentally strangled her until she died. He then allegedly told Christina that he took the girl's body to his parents' property where he buried her on an old horse grave in garbage bags and with lime. Joel told Christina that he felt really guilty. He felt responsible for his father's death because Joel had actually told his father that, you know, he did this to the escort who did turn out to be Kara. Christina told the FBI that she actually did believe that both of his parents knew exactly what happened and that they were both trying to cover for him. So basically what he's saying is that he told his parents what he did and that his father actually felt pretty bad, felt really guilty or whatever it was for trying to keep this secret and maybe, I don't really know exactly how he died, but maybe he had a heart attack or a stroke or some sort of death that you know, could have been caused by such immense stress. And again, this is probably why Betty led the searchers around and was basically telling them not to search these horse graves, which honestly is just pretty sick to me that all of these people withheld this information for 10 years. I don't wanna to sound too judgmental because I am happy that Christina finally came forward with this information, but I don't understand why it took so long. Literally eight years, after Joel told her that he murdered somebody. She didn't come forward either. She didn't voluntarily contact the police or contact the FBI to try to tell them what she knew. 
the FBI had to track her down and had to ask her for an interview. I really don't understand why she didn't say anything for this long time. They weren't even married anymore, so she had nothing to protect. And then for his parents, at least his mom, to deliberately steer the searchers in the wrong direction is absolutely sick. I don't want to say too much about his father because he is deceased and he can't stand up for himself or speak for himself but his mother clearly knew. Joel's mother literally had a dead human body on her property and she was just cool with it to try and protect their disgusting predator son. But police are also to blame for this. They should have excavated the site whether they were told to skip it or not. I'm sure Betty seems like a nice lady, the type of mom that, you know, bakes you cookies and gives the police officers lemonade to help them with their searches or whatever, but clearly, parents are willing to do a lot to cover up for their children. That was a bad judgment call on the police's end to just assume that this mother was going to help them and not her son. So by February 7th, 2022, at around 6.52 a.m., Joel was taken into custody on an unrelated warrant. He then agreed to speak with two detectives who interviewed him with regards to Kara's case. To these two detectives, he again admitted that he did know Kara and that he had spoken with her, but denied ever meeting up with her or being responsible for her death. However, these detectives went in with a new tactic. The detectives asked him to identify where these horses had been buried on his parents' properties over the years. They showed Joel an aerial view of this property using Google Maps and asked him to point out these different areas. So he pointed out a couple of different areas on the property, but when he was asked about one specific spot that the search team had specifically labeled GPR Site 3, he said that it was a dry patch with a high spot, but there was nothing buried there. So then these two detectives also went and questioned Joel's mother, Betty. They also asked her to point to the different areas where the horses had been buried on their property. They then pointed her to the spot labeled GPR Site 3 and asked her what was there. Betty told detectives that this site was the burial spot of her favorite horse, Milo. So that same day on February 7th, 2022, police went back to Joel's parents' property at 6995 Burgress Road and searched the area where the GPR Site 3 had previously been identified. As they excavated about three feet deep, they discovered a black plastic garbage bag. Upon inspection, they did find human remains within this garbage bag, these remains were thought, of course, to belong to then 19-year-old Kara Nichols. According to an affidavit that would later be filed, police summarized that they believe that on the night of October 9th, 2012, Joel arranged to pick up Kara near her Mission Road's house due to the fact that Kara only did out calls because she did not have a license or a vehicle or any other means of transportation. Sometime after Joel had picked her up, he strangled Kara until she died. Joel then transported her to his parents' property on the route that we discussed earlier. After getting to the property, her phone goes dead, most likely because Joel shut it off. He then buried her on his parents' property and then everything happened just as we discussed. Going back to the spot that Betty had pointed police to in the area that was across the street that she said it was an area that Joel had access to, I almost wonder if she was originally buried there and then moved to the actual property and then buried over the horse grave there. I don't know if Joel had just buried her there and then told his parents and then they're like, no, don't bury her there. Bury her on the horse grave. No one will ever find her that way. But then again, I don't imagine that his mom, who was clearly just trying to save him, would point them to an actual spot where her body once was because again, seeing the fact that there was a grave there makes it pretty obvious that he may have buried someone there. So I don't know what her reasoning was for, you know, pointing out this site. Obviously, it probably was to throw them off so that they would see this burial site and say, hey, she might have been moved here. I wonder where she is now or something like that. But it still doesn't really make sense to me because that's kind of pointing them towards Joel and not away from him. So... I don't really know what her reasoning was behind that. I don't know if she even knew that this other like kind of human grave was there and she you know, was just trying to throw them off. I don't really know the reasoning for that, but I do think that it's a little bit strange and I wish we knew why. Because yeah, if she's trying to throw them off, why would she point them in the direction that a human was once buried? 
that doesn't really make any sense to me. But either way, after the discovery of Kara's remains, police swiftly arrested 46-year-old Joel Hollendorfer in connection with Kara Nichols' murder. He initially was charged with second-degree murder as well as tampering with evidence. During this initial hearing, his bond was raised from $500,000 to a million dollars, he was also deemed a flight risk and was ordered to surrender his passport. But then in a following hearing, his charges were upped to first degree murder based on the results of the autopsy, which I don't believe have been publicly released yet. His bond of a million dollars was also revoked, so there's no way he's gonna be able to leave prison on bond. Now, obviously we have to wonder if Joel went there with the intention to kill Kara, or if he truly went there for her escort services and then things got out of control and he strangled her. However, me personally, just based off of the information that we know, I do think that he went there with the intent to kill her. Knowing the timeline and the cell phone pings and just how fast this entire thing happened makes me think that he went there and then killed her pretty quickly. There just doesn't seem to be any time for him to pick her up and then the two somehow get into an argument and then the two are engaging in sexual relations and then he accidentally strangles her. I just don't see how that would have happened in such a short period of time. Plus, they found something on the autopsy that made them up the charges to first degree murder, so it must have been pretty damning. For those of you who don't know the difference, second degree murder is basically if you get really angry and you kill someone in the heat of the moment, so there is that intent to kill someone, but it wasn't planned or premeditated. First degree murder is when it was planned and premeditated, so you planned it out, you thought of how you were gonna kill someone, and then you executed it. So there must have been something in that autopsy that showed that he went there with the intention to kill her. So that is really intriguing to me, and I'm really curious as to what it is. Of course, I will be following up on this case, and if there is more information released on the autopsy results, I will be sharing that with all of you. And of course, once this trial happens, I will also keep you guys up to date on any new information that comes out. After the discovery of Kara's remains, her family came out with the following statement. It is with profound sadness and a heavy heart that we share that we were informed yesterday by authorities that our beautiful daughter's remains were found and our suspect has been arrested in the case. We are writing to express our sincere gratitude and appreciation for all of those who tirelessly gave time, money, attention, and assistance to finding Kara over the past 10 years. Due to the unremitting support and help from the National Women's Coalition Against Violence and Exploitation the past decade, they will continue to be by our family's side, manage his page, and be a voice for Kara as we seek justice in this case. The family spokeswoman, Michelle Bart of the National Women's Coalition Against Violence and Exploitation, also came out with a statement of her own. She said, quote, to have to write this breaks my heart. After almost 10 years, we have hoped the outcome would be different, but here we are. Kara was a daughter, sister, niece, and friend to many. Kara's life mattered in 2012 and still matters in 2022. Our work is not over. It's now time to see the person or people responsible for her death are brought to justice. We will be advocating that no matter how the defense tries to spin Kara's character. We will remind the world she was an innocent person who, no matter her lifestyle choices, she never deserved to leave us like she did. Let us remember, no matter the circumstances, Kara did nothing wrong to deserve this ending. She went on to say that Joel isn't the only one who should be facing charges for Kara's death. She claimed that prosecutors believe that Joel's mother, Betty, had a questionable knowledge and involvement in Kara's death. She's also upset that the people investigating this case knew about these cell phone records and the property for over a decade, but didn't do anything further to prosecute Joel, which I agree with the fact that they knew about these cell phone pings back in 2014 and didn't do anything further after, you know, not even excavating any of the sites that the dogs hit on is really lazy and it's really disturbing and it's really heart-wrenching, honestly. So that is where the case stands as of right now. I'm really looking forward to seeing if anything about Joel or anything else about this crime comes out in the trial. The only really thing that we know about Joel is that he did have a criminal history of domestic violence against his ex-wife, 
but otherwise we don't really know anything else about him, his family dynamic, or anything else. So we'll just have to wait for the trial to see what comes out about all of this. My heart breaks for Kara's family who clearly loved and cared about her so very much. I can't even imagine the heartbreak knowing that police had so much information for so many years yet they just sat on it and didn't do anything with it. They just let this predator walk free and live his life for 10 whole years while their daughter was in the ground buried in a horse grave. This entire thing just breaks my heart, but I'm at least happy that they now finally have the answers that they've needed. They're now able to put Kara to rest and feel comfortable knowing that the man responsible for her murder is now behind bars. And hopefully he will never see the light of day ever again. As with any case that I cover that's like this one where the victim was involved in these lifestyle choices, please no hate or judgment towards Kara. As we saw in these other quotes and statements, they understand what Kara was doing. They understand that she was doing these escort services. They understand that she was doing things that were dangerous. She was meeting up with strange men who she didn't know. The family understands these we understand them. We all know that what she was doing put her at this risk, but that does not mean that she deserved for her life to end. She was only 19 years old. If we are all judged based on the decisions that we made when we were 19 years old, then none of us would look in a really good light because we do things that are risky. We do things that looking back weren't a great idea. Not all of us are involved in, you know, escort services or things like this. But still, let's not judge a 19 year old for her decisions. She clearly didn't know exactly where she wanted to go in her life. She was just trying to make money. She was just trying to make ends meet and clearly didn't quite understand the implications of being involved in this type of work. So again, nothing but positive comments and support to the family for the daughter that they lost 10 years ago. But with that, that is where I'm going to end today's video. I'm really looking forward to hearing what all of you think about this case. What do you think really happened that night with Joel? Do you think he went there with the intention to kill her or do you think it was a situation of things getting out of control? What are your thoughts on Joel's mother's involvement? Do you think that she knew everything and was trying to get police away from her son or do you think that there's another explanation for this? What do you think his father's involvement was? Let's discuss this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you liked this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Don't forget to go ahead and follow my Twitter and Instagram. Both will be linked down below. My Twitter is where I keep the most up to date with any case that I cover. So if you want to hear more information on the trial and anything that comes out about Kara's case, make sure you go ahead and follow my Twitter. If you have absolutely any case suggestions, please make sure to send those suggestions over to my email at rachelshannoncases at gmail.com. With that, I hope you guys have a great week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time. Bye.